social movements, but to talk about structures that might be incentives, determinants, uh, openings to social protest. And that was what I was assigned. That's what I'm going to do. And much of this, many of you should know. If you don't, then you're not reading the newspapers enough. But I have to do it anyway. So here we go. Now I have to make the computer go. Mm. I, by the way, we're all adults, no pictures of George W. Bush, no pictures of Nicolas Sarkozy. Perhaps I should have put a picture up of Gordon Brown since everybody's forgotten him, but <clears throat> the, the, the actual actors, and I should say probably mécréants in this story that I'm about to tell, uh, I just got words here because you can envisage George W. Bush. If you've forgotten him, remember him. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'm gonna. The, the, if this focus is protest in austerity, which I think it's a pretty narrow description of what you're about to do, it's much more than that. <coughs> what is the major producer of austerity? It's today's economic crisis. And by the way, it's not over. Uh, you all know that, but just to remind you. Uh, and it's a truism, I think, that great large financial and economic crises are producers of austerity and they are also producers of unforeseen and unforeseeable uh, social protest movements. Look at the Great Depression. Look at the aftermath of the Great Depression. Uh, uh, good example, I think. Anyway, uh, these crises are endemic to capitalism. I hate to introduce the word capitalism, but it's part of the game here. Uh, and they open up all kinds of spaces for all kinds of protests, left, right, unclassifiable, dangerous, benevolent, etc. This particular crisis, which is, of course, as everyone knows, the largest since the Great Depression after 1929, which means a lot, is really two connected and distinct moments. They're connected, but they're distinct. The first is Anglo-American finance exploding. The globalized financial sector, which really was propelled from Wall Street and the city of London into all kinds of corners, blew up. You know that. And the second part of the crisis, which is probably more, more pertinent to many of your papers, which are excellent, by the way, is the explosion of the Eurozone. This is different. It's not the same thing. The explosion of the Eurozone, I think, can be divided into two critical acts in terms of our theme of structures, crisis, and austerity. The first is that uh, uh, the members of the Eurozone and the European community botched the initial response to the crisis, making it worse. The second is uh, that they then put their shoulders to some kind of wheel kind of wheel is important, and try to repair the Eurozone, have yet to succeed in doing so, even though things look a little bit calmer, uh, and they did it in a certain way. And I'm going to try to eliminate what that way means in terms of austerity and structures. Okay. First, the first part of the crisis, the one we know best, and the one there are a million books on this, and everybody talks about it even now. <coughs> Lehman Brothers, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, as we see in all these movies, uh, is the critical moment. But uh, there are preludes, uh, and the preludes are, are well known, but they're worth underlining. The preludes are neoliberalism, uh, which basically said markets solve all important problems and should be left alone to solve, solve them without much regulation. Hence, re deregulation of the financial sector and uh, Anglo-American public policies, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them later because they're quite specific and very important. Anyway, in 2008, after about a year of shaking, croaking, the financial sector blew up. Uh, Lehman Brothers, nobody knew what to do. They couldn't find anybody to buy Lehman Brothers, so it was allowed to go bankrupt and the stock market blew up and, and uh, we were off to the races. 
And the first thing that presented itself to everybody, and it's amazing, this is one area in which the economists seem to agree what to do, not everything else. Uh, there was an international uh, liquidity and credit freeze. That meant that banks could, didn't have, wouldn't have any money unless somebody did something about it, and they were failing anyway, and they wouldn't loan to each other. And all of the complicated apparatus of, of uh, overnight lending and so on just went away, uh, or threatened to go away. And the obvious message was that if we don't do something about this, the real economy will be hit, and then we'll be in the 1930s again. That was uh, clearly uh, what people were thinking at the time. And it took a while, and these are important things to note, I think, about this. In the United States, there were quite incomprehensible, unless you're an American as I am, struggles between the Republicans and the Democrats about what to do. Uh, I remember that my spouse and I were giving a talk in Halifax, I think, in the middle of the week when Congress refused to uh, approve the president, the Republican president's proposals to stop bailouts and, and, and uh, talk and so on. And uh, it, it was really like something out of medieval jousting to have watched. Uh, the Republicans said uh, throwing money at this problem is not going to let people basically sink. Uh, and you'll see afterwards everything will be clear in about 10 years. And the Democrats and, and, and the technocrats all said, no, if you do that, everybody's in the soup. Everybody, not only us, but every problem, everyone probably in the, in the uh, connected world. Then what happened uh, after uh, the Lehman Brothers, the Anglo-Americans took the lead in proposing what to do. And they developed what became quickly a kind of international economic policy consensus on a set of things to do. Uh, bailouts, bailing out the financial sector, plans to stimulate the, econ the real economy so that everybody wouldn't be unemployed, only if 10% or 15% would be unemployed, and then to re-regulate the financial sector. Uh, this, I think, arguably, prevented what would have been a new Great Depression. And a new Great Depression would have been probably worse than the old Great Depression. Uh, and ended up in the Great Recession, as it was called. And it turned out to be bad enough. By the way, one of the blessings of this, and probably one of the, I think what may turn out historically to be a relatively nice blessing, was that the Republicans didn't win the presidency in the United States because of this. Barack Obama probably would not have won the presidency of the United States without this, uh, despite all of the attributes to which he, uh, about which we all know. So this is not so bad, but uh, we're in the great recession. Okay? Uh, the, this means that the global real economy was saved from the very worst, which would have been a really <coughs> near total collapse. Uh, but the result was a an economic downturn in quite large proportions with very high levels of new unemployment that varied, and it's terribly important for your purpose, I think, to realize how much it did vary from country to country and place to place. Some countries had good crises, have had relatively good crises. Other countries have not, as you know. Okay, second point about this is the rescue plans cost a ton of money. They were borrowed money, and taxpayers were put on hook for this. There was a great deal of lost growth, which there's still is a great deal of lost growth, even though levels of potential growth in the future are very low. We're still living in the Great Recession from a growth point of view. There was a great deal of lost tax revenue due to unemployment and the need to deploy automatic stabilizers. And, uh, and the cost, basically, of bailouts and stimulus. Bailing out the banks cost a ton of money, and the stimulus plans cost further tons of money, even though they mainly went to the same places. So what you had across the rich world and across basically, yeah, across the rich world, I guess rich world is the right phrase here, a substantial increase in national debt. The numbers, are, I could have put them out, but they're pretty, they're pretty clear. 30, 20, 30 percent more than would have otherwise been the case if there had been continuity. Uh, and the increase in national debt foreshadows future austerity. 
it would have been the case probably no matter who was in government that the screws would have been put on to cut back on public spending in order to reduce levels of public debt. And that uh, would have produced austerity of one kind or another practically everywhere. Those who are most hurt, and this I'm going to repeat two or three times, but it's worth repeating. Uh, male manufacturing and construction workers, those people who were at the core of the, what little growth there was in the real economies of, of the rich world. And more importantly, perhaps, those on the wrong side of the dualized labor markets, that's a, that's a catchphrase, you know, but uh, that means the people who are in insecure positions on low ends of the labor market, who have grown substantially over the past 20, 30 years, perhaps since the 1960s. Uh, and this means young people, people without sufficient skill training, education, including immigrants. These are the people who are most likely generic targets for real, real troubles and austerity. Uh, and they tend, tend to turn up in your protest as well, as we know. But, uh, it's not simply economics. We know that the disputes that we read in the, in the paper and in the specialized press are often this economist fighting with that economist about this theory and that model as a way of understanding and getting out of this mess. But in fact, politics was really more key to this than, in, than economics. Economics is in the background all the time, and economic economists deserve a great deal of blame for all of this stuff. Uh, we can talk about that if you want. But, uh, uh, in particular, if I may be permitted as an American citizen, Anglo-American economists who had hegemon hegemony over the economic field and their ideas like the great moderation and so on, that deserves to be examined as not actually science, I think. Okay. Uh, there had been similar American and British policies in a couple of other places, Iceland, strange places, Ireland, uh, that deregulated uh, finance, financial sectors and encouraged what turned out to be dubious risk management uh, practices. And these were what exploded in the crisis. We all know subprimes and derivatives and all that stuff. Uh, and these things were not only confined to Wall Street and uh, the sea. They seeped rapidly through the banking sector practically everywhere in the rich world and elsewhere, but mainly in Europe. Uh, there was a guy whose name I've forgotten who, who described after the fact what, what it was like to be in the middle of all this. He knew. He claimed to know that this stuff was going to blow up, that all these derivatives, and said, he said, uh, when the music plays, you have to dance. And it's one of those processes that even if you, you had doubts about what was going on, or, uh, if you wanted to keep your job on Wall Street or in a bank, you had to do it. And there was also, and this is another public policy thing that's really very important, uh, in the United States and the UK, and it was copied widely, there were policies to boost consumption on credit. You know, mortgages, but not only mortgages. Uh, credit cards, uh, uh, secondary loans on, on houses. Uh, and these, uh, this strategy, and this is, I think you can see it as a strategy to allow people to consume despite the fact they didn't have the incomes necessary to consume anything with. Uh, this created bubbles in housing, which was where the thing really grew, but also in construction and substantial increases in private debt that were probably not realistic in terms of the incomes of the people who took on the private debt, or most of them anyway. These bubbles, when they popped, created the crisis. But these bubbles were created by public policy and markets working together, which is a mystery why the markets were taking so much risk. I don't think it's a mystery when you look at the politics of it all. Uh, but another dimension of this, the, the, what is it, the, the um, lack of balance in the international economy growing out of globalization is worthy of mention, I think. These policies depended on the financial sectors of the US and the UK and other places to a lesser degree, floating domestic consumption on credit so that people could purchase cheap, the cheap imported goods, mainly from Asia, but from other places, 
uh, in order to maintain their consumption and on the people who are exporting, we have a, the Chinese and others who have an export-oriented development policy, being willing to buy the bonds of the countries that were floating their consumption on credit. And so the Chinese essentially are financing American consumption in order to sell Chinese goods. And I'm not saying the Chinese are the only thing, but this, this is, the question is, is this a sustainable model? That's a bigger issue, I think, in this whole discussion, because I think the, we're returning to that model very rapidly. But that's another question. Um, there's a couple of things that I enjoyed reading. Wolfgang Streich is one of the smartest of our colleagues, I think. You know, he's one of the most pessimistic of our colleagues as well. And there's a good little piece, it's not social science, it's kind of descriptive in No Love For You, who sees these policies as another, I use the word desperate, attempt to reconfigure the post-World War II social contract in advanced societies between markets and democracy, which means between rich people and working people, uh, <coughs> by allowing the buying in of citizens by floating growth and middle class lifestyles after the exhaustion of the Keynesian wealth, Keynesian welfare state and the failure of the Reagan Thatcher deflation period. Um, interesting hypothesis. Basically divides the post World War II period into several stages of attempts to buy in citizens into uh, market success, none of which succeeded in the last one, blows up. Uh, another book that I Yes, it's very good on the imbalances of the global system, but it's an essay, these are both essays. Jean-Marc Severino and Olivier Ray, Le Grand Basculement, it was recommended to me by Pascal Dami, so it must be a sort of centrist book, but it's a good book. Uh, uh, other long-term processes at work here in the story. Uh, three plus decades of center-right, or right, I would call counter-revolution, it comes from Thatcher and Reagan, etc. And the triumph of neoliberalism in public policy in general, and I think probably quite critical to the story of credit finance growth, longer run growth in inequality, which is most exaggerated in the United States, but true also elsewhere. And there's another dimension of this which nobody ever mentions, but it's probably pertinent somewhere in the closet of your reflection. I think, or maybe it should be. The slow down, the slow decline in the appeal of traditional social democracy as a kind of vacuum cleaner for progressive thought and mobilization. Uh, the program promises of traditional social democracy have been exhausted largely by its success in many ways, but also by its acceptance of managing capitalism and so on in a way that they had to, they had to be accepted any utopian claims of social democracy as being transformative or even strongly reformist are largely dissipated. This, I think, is a, a, probably one of the important dimensions of something that you'll talk about, a kind of generalized political crisis and skepticism about effective national politicians being able to solve national problems. Globalization is in the mix here, too. But this is very serious, I think, and you know, we know social democrats can win elections, because they do. Uh, but they win elections because the other guys do bad, basically. The incumbents get kicked out. Uh, the, the appeal of social democracy, uh, I'm a lifelong social democrat, left social democrat, and uh, you've got voting these days is a great pain. Uh, and I'm not alone. Enthusiasm is hard to sustain. And then there's finally globalization, which I just mentioned. Uh, Finance was the most globalized sector, way, way ahead of everywhere else. Uh, and it was led by Wall Street and the city. You know, there were complex uh, PhD developed uh, derivative <coughs> games and gambling and, <coughs> and so on, uh, some of which are ingenious, of course. But the most global, I mean, that means if something happens in a particular place, like Wall Street, which is where it happened, or London, it's going to spread everywhere. Uh, 
this is, a, I think, an interesting occurrence because when things blew up, things blow up every 10 years since capitalism. There's a financial crisis every 10 years. It always has been. In the more uh, previous crises, we're all sort of Argentina, Mexico, uh, the Asia. And uh, you could read the newspapers, you could see the basic Anglo-American hubris coming out. These people are primitive. They don't know how to manage their economies. Their policies stunk. Uh, we could have told them. They didn't listen to us, etc., etc. Well, now we can't say that anymore. Actually, it is being said, but you can't say that anymore. <laughs> uh, this is a disease that comes from the center. It's not a disease of the outliers. And in globalization, and this is probably also part of your story, I think, somewhere. Manufacturing has clearly been leaving the richer areas. Some places less, some places more. But the actual content of manufacturing in, in most of these economies has been declining. And managing those who are hurt by the migration of manufacturing, this is in the background, uh, becomes a burning political issue everywhere. It has been for some time. It's connected to neoliberalism, it's connected to inequality, and it's connected in the political sphere to the emergence practically everywhere, including, well, perhaps not Canada, I don't know, uh, new hard lefts emerging on the side of social democratic parties. You know, they get 10% of the vote, but they're taken very seriously. And they basically have a cutting edge of refusing further motion in the direction of this, these processes. And then real, nasty, xenophobic hard rights. And you just look at the list of a number of xenophobic hard right parties that are either close to coalitions or influencing right and movements in Europe or the United States or Canada. Yeah, Canada's included. So it's pretty impressive. And it's all got to do with, uh, well, we can talk about that, I mean, malaise about these trends. It's the, the great cry in the United States. I, somebody should write a book about the introduction of the concept of middle class. Is it be kind of sociology from above? Because I think it's really an invention of the media and academics, and, and, and it goes very well. Anyway, uh, this, the hysteria about the, uh, about the very real uh, threats to the so-called middle class, because they're basically reducible to, to us and a bunch of uh, blue-collar workers who were unionized and protected and who had prospects for social mobility and no longer uh, have that and in the crisis in particular, who, who form in many ways uh, the, the backbone of much of the hard right, uh, new hard right stuff. Anyway, uh, and losses in the capacity through globalization, the capacities of nation states, member states, even the biggest ones, the most powerful ones, to actually uh, steer, control, regulate in a serious way. Their national economy accentuates declining citizen trust that politicians are, are able to really do what they, everybody thinks they ought to be able to do. Anti-elitism, for example. And we have, of course, this, one of the things that's on your, on your background table, the background of anti-globalization movements that were pretty powerful and still are to some extent. And they left legacies, protest repertories, to use the vocabulary of some people in our fields. Uh, they left technologies of mobilization. They left ideas and senses of how you frame things and so on. They probably spill over into the present. OK. Uh, okay. Now, this is just a spin out, and I'm just apologizing for not solving your problem. New spaces, new issues. Uh, do not explain the protest actors. We know that. That's not enough. We're no longer Marxists in that sense. We no longer ascribe behaviors to class positions or things like that. Even though a lot of people still do it. It's a kind of sociodemographic derivation of behavior that you see in electoral studies, for example. Uh, structures do not make protests. They open space for them. Uh, and I think it's important to say, and again, it's by now, higher unemployment, growing inequality, widespread new economic insecurity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, greater pessimism about elites, greater pessimism about the future. 
may very well feed protest behaviors. And certainly, this situation has fed into one of the words I hate the most, populism. Populism is basically a, a word that describes things that intellectuals don't like. For the most part. Excuse me, that's a bit, a bit schematic, but nonetheless, be careful of using the word. But, uh, and all of this stuff, new right nationalism and xenophobia, uh, new left economic mobilization that is very often protectionist, uh, a new mis mistrust of political elites, and, and, and like the populist movements in the United States in the late 19th century, a kind of real demonization of the financial sector for very good reasons. But this is important. Final point is that, that and I'll come back to this in numbers in a minute, some places had better crises. And that's a mystery for us all, too, I think. Canada, Poland, of all places. Poland's been moving along like it, like it, a, a, a gigantic uh, train. Uh, relatively good growth. Uh, very little, my Poles moan and groan all the time, but very little uh, beyond that. Uh, the Nordics have done reasonably well in the crisis. They seem to always do well in crises. I don't quite interesting point. Uh, uh, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, relatively well, even though there are serious problems. There are serious problems in all places because of the crisis. Uh, and some of these countries are importantly not involved in the Eurozone crisis in, in, a, in, a, in a symptom symptomatic way. They are involved in political ways, which is very important. But this kind of distribution of, of, of the pain of crisis to some people and not others, it needs to be explained. Uh, bad and better crises. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the US. This is the US profile. Uh, unemployment is a good proxy, but there are all kinds of things you can talk about. Uh, the United States crisis was pretty bad. A loss of growth real serious loss of growth, high unemployment, piles of new debt. The United States is up there with some of the Eurozone problematic places, were it not for the fact that uh, the dollar and treasury bonds are seen as a safe haven, uh, the United States would be in a lot deeper trouble. Slow recovery, huge political conflict. Don't forget that the Republicans versus the Democrats is about this stuff. And the likelihood of prolonged austerity. But uh, the UK crisis is very similar, but perhaps worse. The UK is living a very serious period of austerity. And there are, as you know, some protests, but there's not as much as you would have anticipated, which is an interesting question. Uh, Canada. Uh, I'm not a Canadian, so I was asked to talk about Canada, but there's nothing much to say about Canada in the crisis. Uh, Canada can't avoid global downturns and rising unemployment. Nobody can. But it had better blank banking regulation. It was, to an extent, resource-based. Uh, and despite the decline in demand for the resources, there was still demand for the resources. Oil is always saleable. Uh, and its budgetary policies, largely because Canada took a real big hit in the 1990s, uh, its budget was in good shape. So it could take on greater debt and still not really be in big trouble. And the others, uh, similar, uh, similar reasons for being in better shape. There's also competitive positions. The, the Nordics, uh, Austria, Germany had uh, better export positions which could recover more rapidly and they pursued intelligent policies to allow it to happen. Even though serious dual labor market problems exist <coughs> Uh, bad crisis. This is a transition to the Eurozone. You can't read this stuff. But if you look at the trend lines, all of the top, these are trend lines, I can't even see what it is. Unemployment, and youth unemployment in 2011, those are good proxies. The top four trend lines are Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. So it's a really horrible situation. Uh, the middle trend lines are the Eurozone average, France and Italy, and the low trend lines are Germany, good crisis. France had a relatively good crisis, but it still had, it had high unemployment to, be, unemployment to begin with, high use unemployment to begin with, and uh, uh, debt problems to begin with, so it's sort of middling. 
the endless Eurozone mess. Now this gets into sort of biblical uh, uh, complexity. Go through it anyway. What the hell? And it has two acts. First is the famous sovereign debt crisis in economic and monetary union. Remember that. If you don't know that already. Uh, what happened over time since the installation of the Euro and Economic and Monetary Union, among other things, is financial globalization. And Economic and Monetary Union greatly enhanced the fluidity of financial movements within the Eurozone. Banks thought, because they thought the sovereign debt risk was removed and, and that a single currency made it all safe. They lent money all over the place. That's how banks made their money. This is really basically a banking crisis to begin with. Uh, also, nobody tells that story very well. We, I don't think we really know what happened to these banks yet. Okay, what happens in banks is one of the great secrets. It's sort of like what happens in people's bedrooms. Uh, Mrs. Th Mrs. Merkel, the great figure in the Eurozone crisis, doesn't really open up to what the hell's going on in German banks. And, anyway, uh, very important, I think. Uh, but at EMU had low interest rates, single interest rates, and the disappearance of national bond risks encouraged a lot of Eurozone growth on credit. And this, as it happened, was growth that promoted inflation and didn't help competitiveness. It was growth that was the, targeted on domestic consumption rather than, than growth and productivity. When the global crisis occurred and the Grand Recession followed, it exposed the southern EMU members who were most indebted, and Greece was the first. I'm not going to get into the Greece story because it's more complicated than that. But, but then what happened was the bond markets who were holding Greek debt and Irish debt and so on, Began to speculate on the capacity of these countries to repay their debts. Interest rates on the bonds rose, creating risks like default and contagion. This was, uh, most of these countries took on huge debt during the crisis, as I mentioned, in order to do the stimulus plans and the bailout stuff. So they were really vulnerable. Some are more vulnerable than others, and that, that's what happened. And what these trends did uh, over time also, these trends of the history of was to feed divergence rather than convergence, which I've been the alleged goal of EMU. Uh, and uh, you had the emergence already of a more successful, relatively more successful northern Europe, and a debt floated less competitive south. So that blew up. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting thing. Nobody cares about the European Union anymore. Everybody thinks it's dead. But I, I'm a specialist in This was a lousy deal. EMU. It was a terrible deal. I don't know, maybe you can read. Um, this was, I mean, multilateral negotiations in the EU. The, the leaders always say, we made a great step forward, but nobody ever says, well, the great step was flawed here, there, and everywhere. That, this was a real mess, this deal, 1991, 1992. And uh, it became sort of gospel. So it made, in many ways, was a barrier to coping with this. So what happens? Uh, they had to do two things. They had to do firefighting, or they, they had to be convinced to do firefighting, to put the crisis out, and they did not do it. But at the same time, they had to reform the whole thing because the whole thing was a lousy deal. Uh, and everything had to be done, how? In multilateral negotiations. Multilateral negotiations, we all took international relations one-on-one, right? We know that the strongest guys get their way and that their preferences tend to over-determine any solutions. That's exactly what happened here, what has happened consistently and what continues to happen. Germany was by far the most powerful economically and politically, and its Ordnungspolitik, its ordo-liberal preferences dominated and have dominated and probably will continue to dominate what happens in this crisis and in the EU, for better or worse. Uh, 
So, uh, fight the, what, fighting the fires, what interestingly happened was the Germans decided, Angela Merkel, uh, the very tightly organized German elite, that they didn't want to help Greece, they wanted to scold Greece. They, six months passed in the crisis before anybody could do anything because the Germans did not want to do anything. You know, there was all this talk about the Greeks should sell their islands, and uh, uh, it was their fault, and they should suffer, uh, and the German press was full of this stuff. Uh, and so for the, during the six months, contagion began. The Irish were threatened, the Portuguese were threatened, there all these are different stories. And later on, Spain and Italy, which are still threatened to, to a lesser degree, what happened? When they decided to do something, again, it was the Germans who did, pretty much decided what course to follow. Their loans to, to bail out these countries were inadequate, they were incremental, they didn't solve the problems, and they were biased very, very seriously towards punitive hysteria. Scold the damn Greeks. Scold these people who didn't play the game properly. Make them suffer so that they will follow the true way after they stop suffering, if they stop suffering. If they can't suck it up and, and, and do what they're supposed to do, too bad. Okay. And you had basically, as a result, in internal devaluations, everybody knows what that means, right? German style, Germans had just gone through this themselves, which destroyed growth and worsened the debt situation everywhere in these, in these threatened countries. Internal devaluations are basically go back to welfare state, lower wages, uh, whether people like it or not. That's, uh, okay. The crisis is not yet over, and everybody makes light of this. So there's a good piece, a good piece in the FT yesterday by Martin Wolf about this. The European Central Bank has played a very kind of emollient role in all this, and things look better for the moment. But uh, whether any of the uh, new reform measures will work is not known. Uh, there has and there will be a serious loss of national sovereignty over the national fiscal policies as a result of this. But it won't be democratic, it will be technocratic. Because nobody can agree how to do it democratically, and nobody really wants to do it democratically. And there's going to be a banking union which also is going to remove sovereignty, but yet again in a technocratic. And the results are embedded and will continue in, in, in order liberal thinking, more austerity, more internal evaluation, more reconfigured welfare states, more flexibilized labor markets. Some of these things are probably, in a certain measure, uh, useful, but not the way it's being hit. And the north-south divisions are now pretty cast in concrete. Uh, the broader consequences of all this, we have deadly deep recessions in all of the countries that were deeply affected huge unemployment, uh, and once again, the list. Immigrants, young people, labor market outsiders, uh, who are hurt the most. If this goes on for 10 years, you can figure out what happens to a, a generation of people who now have to live with their parents until they're 35. Uh, that'll make them angry enough to, to, to protest, I'm sure. But uh, this is quite likely to go on uh, for quite a while. And there will, on political consequences, mobilization are unclear. There will be very large, there are and have been, will be, and will continue to be very large welfare state cutbacks, tough labor market reforms, and public sector downsizing, including education, which is a terrible thing. Uh, and what's happening politically, we can see it just by reading the newspapers, when you're in power, you get kicked out of power when you're in this situation. So uh, you had this incredible situation, nobody makes any, anything of but all throughout Southern Europe, there were Social Democrats who were in power when this hit. They're all gone. The center-right is now in power. Maybe the Social Democrats will come back because their center-right isn't doing much better. But, but it's a real blow. This was a real, one of the few growth areas of European social democracy and stuff. Okay. And there have been a wide range of protests, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Growing Euro skepticism. Terribly important, which makes European solutions difficult to do. More, more, more data. And now, street politics. I don't have anything to say about it. It's your job. And it's a hard job. And I know how hard it is. And it makes my head spin to think about. I've read some of your papers and they're great. 
really hard to figure out what the mysteries are in this. I think. Uh, none of what I said and what I might have said if I ranted and raved a little bit longer can really account for the transnational contagion that we see across the Mediterranean. And if you want to talk about that, you would probably need to talk about crisis in um, the Arab world, which is a totally different story, an interesting story, but it's not my story. Uh, and to reiterate, the impact of all these actual austerity measures and so on varies very greatly from country to country, as do the institutional structures of countries which make for differences in mobilization. The biggest problems remain on the EU periphery, uh, and this is, of course, the heartland of European street protest, although you have the dogs that don't bark, which is another interesting problem you have to resolve. Uh, which I think some of the papers actually do very well. Uh, one of the things that, that, that is clearly happening, major political changes tied to all of this are occurring. And we see it not only in these southern countries, but in the US, Barack Obama, uh, the UK, uh, you get David Cameron, <coughs> for better, or for worse, I should say, uh, François Hollande, Mario Monti, and whatever the hell is going to happen. This week, uh, there's many, many unsettled political situations, which will remain unsettled because the problems are deeply difficult to resolve. The eurozone crisis is a body blow to European integration. It will be quite a long time before anybody's really enthusiastic about the great European mission. Germanic domination of European choices is a real issue. Listen to Silvio Berlusconi these days. He's really making hay out of this. The crisis has obviously fostered lots of contentious politics, to use Sitaro's term. <coughs> and there's all kinds of other things going on beyond your street politics. Uh, there's a paper on France which I haven't read, but not much happens in France, except when you shut down the Goodyear plant in Anya, people get mad and they really carry on. And uh, that kind of protest is endemic to French history, but it's going on more and more. Uh, Bergeau, it's, uh, there's all kinds of things going on, but they're not what you're looking at. There are all kinds of, there are riots, right? Uh, and popular, anyway. Some places remain quiet. This leaves you guys with a hell of a lot of puzzles to solve. And I wish you well. Thank you.